So, assalamu alaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuhu and welcome to uh, the third day of the five day Quranic Arabic course. Um, how are you finding the course so far? Just type in below, <laughs> um, you know, uh, you know, subhanAllah, are you finding it um, interesting? Did you learn a lot of new things? Um, did you share the class with other people as well? MashaAllah. So, you know, Alhamdulillah, today we're going to be learning something very, very interesting and something that I'm very passionate about as well. And that is pearls from the tafsir, pearls from the tafsir of the Quran, inshallah. So, Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Wa salatu wa salamu ala ashraf al-anbiya wa al-mursaleen. Sayyidina Muhammad wa ala alihi wa ashabihi ajma'een. You know what? Let me just put my brightness a little bit up. Oh, wait. Brightness. How do you put my brightness up? Okay, it's all good. So, uh, let me actually put my brightness up a little bit. So that you guys can fully see. It's totally white. Okay, good. Awesome. So today, inshallah, what we're going to learn in this class is why we should read and learn tafsir instead of translation. So, I, I really want to put this forward that, you know, we really need to learn the tafsir of the Qur'an not maybe instead, but at least with the translation. Okay, so in this class, I want you, I want to tell you the importance of actually uh, studying the tafsir. Okay, and not just reading the English translation, which some some people do. And it's fine as a first step. At least read the English translation. Translation, right? You know, you maybe you can give uh, your non-Muslim neighbor an English translation. Maybe you can give uh, a new river an English translation just so they can get introduced to the Quran. But as soon as you understand that, oh, the Quran is the word of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, and you want to study in depth, then the translation, the English translation or any other language doesn't really cut, cut it. And I'm going to tell you why in this class, that why we need to learn so many other things to understand the Quran. And that is the science of tafsir, okay? Tafsir. Tafsir means the explanation, the exegesis, in fancy words, the exegesis of the Qur'an. The second thing that we're going to learn today is, in depth, the wisdom why the Qur'an was sent down, no, not in one go, but over 23 years in bits and pieces, yeah? Um, yes, so... Unfortunately, uh, I'm sorry, my my camera is <laughs> just the other way. <laughs> yeah, so my and number three is my most recommended books of tafsir from 10 years of experience, inshallah. And we're going to have a little bit of a fun little quiz um, about these books of tafsir, like, you know, from my house. OK, so inshallah, stay until the end and I'll tell you what that actually means. <laughs> so how to make the best of this class, inshallah. First of all, take notes. Mashallah, I've been seeing so many of your notes and I saw your notes from yesterday and I saw some people they wrote in Arabic. Um, you know, maybe it's the first time that they wrote in Arabic. And I really want to appreciate that. And I really want to, um, you know, acknowledge your effort in, you know, trying out something new. Mashallah, you know, Everything has a first step and the first step to learning Arabic is, you know, trying how to just figure out how to write it, write it and learning new words. Mashallah, you guys learned so many new words yesterday. And today, inshallah, we're going to look at more of the big picture and learn the tafsir of the Quran. Number two is participate. Yes, whenever I ask you a question, then answer the questions and encourage others, inshallah. And number three is share the class on your timeline. So Alhamdulillah, we had a lot of shares yesterday. Um, and also on Instagram, Facebook, post your notes or screenshots of the slides on your story and tag me, um, Ukhti or Good Tree Arabic Academy. Yeah. Okay, awesome. Can you guys hear me in the, in the, in the, in the Zoom? Can you hear me? Yes, okay, good. Just making sure. <laughs> Because usually you guys are like chatting and like saying a lot of things. But I guess like my voice is very, you know, you guys are really concentrating. And mashallah, that's good. That's good. Okay, good. Awesome. So, you know, Alhamdulillah, I was really happy. Lots of shares. And yesterday we had 52 shares on the timeline. So, you know, go ahead, 
share that on, on your Facebook uh, page or on your Instagram, because you never know, someone might learn something from this class and it'll bring them closer to the Quran. It will bring them closer to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and it might even change their life and you're going to get the reward for it. Inshallah ta'ala. Yeah. Okay. Beautiful. So we all know that we have a special Quran giveaway. Yes, we have a special Quran giveaway. I will be giving five students this beautiful Quran and the winners will be announced at the end of the five days. So inshallah on Friday at the end. And subhanAllah, after today, there's only going to be two days left. So subhanAllah, um, you know, the days go by so fast and we're already on day five or six of Ramadan. Isn't it amazing? And so if you want to be chosen for this Quran giveaway, there are a few conditions, as we all know. Number one is to attend all days until the end. Okay. Number two is participate in the comment box and encourage others. And you share the class as much as you can on your social media sites. And number three is to do the homework and post it in the group. Or email it to me at Guthrie Arabic Academy or DM it to me on Instagram. It's, it's totally fine. Um, and of course, I do check the homework. I just double tap the, or I like the homework, or I send you like an emoji just to make sure that yes, you are still in the giveaway and you're still part of the class. Okay, awesome, Bismillah. So, who wants to hear a story? Who wants to hear a story? Type yes, I want to hear a story or story time in the chat box if you're ready to hear a story. <laughs> And it's a pretty funny story, actually. It's actually, it's like when I heard it, I, it was funny, but now I think about it, it's like, oh, okay. <laughs> Why would someone do that? But anyway, let's hear the story. So this story is narrated in At-Tafsir Al-Kabir by Imam Razi, Rahimullah. Uh, and inshallah, I'm going to talk about what Tafsir Al-Kabir is uh, at the end of the lesson. So just stay until then. But this is the story of Qadi Yahya bin Aktham, Rahimullah, and the moon, Mas'ala. So this is the story of the moon, uh, the, the question about the moon, and Qadi bin Yahya al Aktham. Okay. And he was a Qadi, he was a judge uh, back in uh, the early days, uh, in the golden days of Islam, I guess, when, you know, in, I'm not really sure exactly which uh, empire he was in, probably the Abbasi Empire. Wallahu alam bisalab. But anyway, the story goes like this. So one day, okay, one day, once upon a time, there was a king, okay, in the time of uh, Qadi Yahya bin Aktham. And the king, um, he had a, his wife, of course. And then one day he was having like, he was, just, he was basically having a date night with his wife on a very beautiful uh, night and the moon was out and the moon was shining and it was bright and it was so beautiful and he was looking at the moon and you know what he looks at his wife and then he says if you are not more beautiful than in, in the, than the moon then you're divorced it's like what seriously seriously man <laughs> but yes this is what he said so what did he say he said if you are not more beautiful than the moon then you're divorced. Subhanallah. Inna lillah. Subhanallah. So, and you know, I don't know what was going through his mind when he said that, but as we all know, divorce is not something that you can play around with. If you say something, then it's going to happen. Right? And after the, 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 the king, he regretted what he said. And obviously the wife was very disturbed as well, because that, that means like she's going to be divorced from her husband and stuff. And, and they went to the scholars and they said, oh, like this thing happened. Um, the king said this thing. So is it going to actually happen? And then all the scholars, they're like, yes, because what else is more beautiful than the moon? The moon is one of the most beautiful creations of Allah, subhanahu wa ta'ala. And, you know, <laughs> sometimes humans can't compare to the moon. It's a different type of beauty. But And all the scholars were like, inna lillah. Divorce ain't a game, people. And then all the scholars, they were like, well, I guess you're divorced. And then the wife of the king was like, oh, she was like crying and she was like so disturbed. And she went to all the scholars in the city 
to find another fatwa, okay? To find a fatwa that will save her from being divorced, <laughs> okay? And then all of a sudden, she goes to, or, you know, the, the man of the story comes along and Qadi Yahya bin Aktham, rahimahullah, he's like, I have the answer. I have the answer that will um, save you from this situation. Now, what do you think he said? Subhanallah. What do you think he said? So he brought up this ayah from the Quran. Surah At-Teen. Who knows what teen means? Teen. What teen was zaytun? What tori sinin? What had the baladil amin? Lakad khalaqanal insana fi ahsani taqweem. What did Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala say in this verse? He said, we have certainly created man in the best of stature, in the best molds, in the best form, in the best creation, subhanAllah. So, subhanAllah, you can see even from this verse, Allah is saying that we have created man, we have created insan. Insan means man, you can write that down, that's a new word that you're learning today. Al-insan. Yes, al-insan means man or mankind. Okay. لَقَدْ خَلَقْنَا الْإِنسَانَ فِي أَحْسَنِ تَقُونَ Okay, we have created mankind in the best of creations. So out of all the creations, all, uh, out of all the creations, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala created the man in the best form. And so that actually means that actually the wife is more beautiful than the moon because Allah said that we have created man in the best forms. We have created man in the most beautiful of forms, subhanAllah. Does everybody understand that? And so after that, the wife was like, okay, alhamdulillah, I'm not divorced and stuff, even though, you know, who knows what happened after that. But at least uh, the king's oath uh, was not fulfilled because in the Quran, it says that al-insan, um, a man or a woman is more beautiful than the moon, more beautiful than any other creation uh, in the best of forms, you know. And subhanAllah, this is something that I want to really uh, bring home to you guys that, you know, every, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has created all of us differently. You know, we have, some of us are tall, some of us are short, some of us are plump, some of us are really skinny. We have different skin colors, we have different body shapes, we have different um, eye colors and hair colors and so many it's just the beauty is in your uniqueness. Your beauty is in the way Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has fashioned you. Your beauty is in the way that, you know, only Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has, you know, has created you in the best of forms. Every single thing in your body is proportionate, you know. And if you really study uh, the human biology uh, and the human body, subhanAllah, you'll actually see that there are so many intricate details that only the Lord of the universe could have, you know, you know, given to us, you know, you know, we make uh, a statue or we make a, um, I don't know, like some building or something like that. How many how, hundreds of people need to be on board to create one like building or to make one project. Okay. Or even to build one robot. Yes. All the scientists nowadays, they're trying to make robots and, artificial intelligence and all this kind of stuff. How many hundreds of people need to be there to make sure that not a single wire is out of place? But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, we have so many wires, we have so many nervous systems and so many cells and so many um, systems happening in our body at all at the same time. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knows every single thing in perfect detail. Yes. So whenever you look in the mirror, just know that you are more beautiful than the moon. <laughs> Subhanallah. And uh, if there is any brothers uh, on, the, on the live stream, then I want you to say to your wife today that Zawjati, my wife, you are more beautiful than the moon. <laughs> and you will be correct. And it will make your relationship better as well, <laughs> by the way. <laughs> so Subhanallah, Yahya Qadi bin Aktham, he knew and understood the true meaning of this verse. He was a true scholar and he applied his knowledge into the real life situation. 
you know and that is the fruit that is the fruit of his knowledge that that uh, that is the fruit of his knowledge subhanallah and who knows how many years he had to study to get to that level of knowledge because all the other scholars they said oh she's going to be divorced but he came up and he said this ayah and the whole situation was resolved you know now another um <clears throat> Another surah that I would like to uh, bring to your attention is this surah, Surah An-Nasr. And it is one of the last 10 surahs in the Quran. Okay. So um, I'll read it for you. Bismillahir Rahmanir Rahim. Ida ja anasrullahi wal fat. Wara eitan na sayyadu khuluna fi dinillahi afwaja. Fasabbih bihamdi rabbika wastaghfir. Who has memorized this surah? You can type in the comment comments below. This is a beautiful surah. I really liked it. And the tafsir of this surah is very amazing as well. So, you know, if we just look at the translation, just the, that's just the translation, yeah, we can see that um, this surah is about Allah's help coming. So, Nasrullah. So, let me just, uh, we can highlight that for you guys. Nasrullah means help of Allah okay Nasr means help Allah means Allah and Fath means victory okay and actually these were this surah was one of the last surahs to be revealed okay because now at this time after 23 years Islam had grown and more people were coming to Islam and that is that was the promise of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala after years of being tortured after years of being ostracized from community and from society, finally the Nasrullah, Nasrullah, the help of Allah had come, you know, and the victory had come. And you see the people, and you see the people embracing Allah's uh, religion in crowds, okay? They're coming into the religion in big crowds. So what are you supposed to do at that time? Glorify the praise of your Lord, do tasbih of the hamd of your Lord, wastaghfir, do istighfar, seek forgiveness, innahu kana tawwaba. Indeed, he is ever accepting of repentance. Now, this is a beautiful meaning of the surah as well. It seems like it's a very like, uh, uh, you know, it has, when you think about it, it's like, oh, I feel happy, you know, like the, the, the it's something to celebrate the nasrullah has come the the help of allah has come it's something to celebrate it's something to do uh, shukr for something to say alhamdulillah for however in this surah i want to tell you the story of abdullah bin abbas radiallahu anhu who was abdullah bin abbas radiallahu anhu so abbas okay abbas radiallahu anhu he was the uncle of the Prophet ﷺ, yeah. So what does Abdullah bin Abbas mean? He what he it means that he was the cousin of the Prophet ﷺ, right? So he was the younger cousin of the Prophet ﷺ, Abdullah bin Abbas. Now Abdullah bin Abbas who he was a young boy, and he, when he, the Prophet ﷺ passed away, he was only thirteen years old. Okay, so he wasn't even like a proper teenager yet. But subhanAllah, at that time, he knew so much knowledge that he was one of the scholars, one of the greatest scholars of the Ummah. And I'll tell you why in this, in this um, story. So one day, Umar radiallahu anhu, when he was the Khalifa, okay, he actually, he used to have, you know, mashwara and he has to have, he, has, he used to have gatherings with um, his uh, companions, okay, um, and especially the companions who had, accepted Islam very early, uh, especially the people of Badr, okay? And um, Omar radiallahu anhu, he, has to, he used to call uh, Abdullah bin Abbas into the gatherings, into the meetings, you know, the, high, the higher end meetings of the Sahaba. And um, the Sahaba, they didn't like it because they had sons who were the same age as Abdullah bin Abbas. And they were like, what's so special about this boy? And he's sitting with us and he's giving his opinion and stuff. So Omar radiallahu anhu, he said to Abdullah bin Abbas, come and sit with us, O Ibn Abbas, and uh, just participate in the discussion. And he wanted to do that to show the Sahaba that actually he was worthy of sitting with them. So during the conversation, Hazrat Umar radiallahu anhu asked the companions of Badr 
what do you say about idha ja anasulullah wal fat so umar radiyallahu he was asking the companions what is the tafsir of idha ja anasulullah wal fat the surah that we just talked about and some said in it we have been enjoined to praise allah we ask for his forgiveness uh, and then with his succor comes uh, we attain victory so they were just doing like a uh, surface based level uh, explanation which is totally fine as well and some others they said it implied the conquest of cities and forts and some of them they knew that umar radiyallahu anhu was testing them so they kept quiet now umar radiyallahu anhu he said he turned to ibn abbas who was the youngest the youngest boy out of every single person sitting with him okay he was probably just a kid at that time as well and he said ibn abbas do you also say the same are you saying the same opinion as these people and ibn abbas says i said no so he's narrating this hadith and he said he asked umar radiyallahu asked then what's your view then he ibn abbas radiyallahu said it means that when the victory of allah subhanahu wa ta'ala comes then it means that it is the last hour of the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam that means that the message of the allah of rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam has been conveyed he has done his responsibility he has gained the victory for his followers and now it is time for him to leave this world subhanallah so can you imagine from from the from the surface of the surah you would never imagine that but abdullah bin abbas radiyallahu anhu he knew the real tafsir he re, he knew the real meaning and the implication of this these ayahs and this surah so he knew that oh when this surah came that means that rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam actually knew that he was going to die very very soon yeah subhanallah does everybody understand that isn't that amazing and that is why umar radiyallahu anhu said i know nothing except what you have said and he said to the companions how can you blame me when you yourselves have seen why i invite this boy to join the assembly now you guys know why i tell ibn abbas to come and sit with us because his knowledge is so vast his knowledge is like impeccable his knowledge is like deeper than the ocean and you know why it's because the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam he abdullah bin abbas he grew up with the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam you know and he was a child and he used to uh, sit with him he used to play with him and the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam used to pat him on the shoulder and pray for him and he used to say oh allah make him acquire a deep understanding of the religion of islam and instruct him in interpretation give him the ilm, the, the knowledge of tafsir allahumma faqihhu fi ad-din wa 'allimhu at-ta'wil ma ma'nahu so subhanallah what does this say about how we should also treat our children or how we should train and uh, raise our children as well subhanallah it's completely possible uh, abdullah bin abbas he was a kid just like any other any of our kids right maybe in a different context in a different time however we as parents we can definitely parents and older siblings and teachers and um you know caretakers as role models for our younger generation we really need to take uh this on board as well because the real knowledge that you can give to your child is not having a master's degree or having a phd and making them learn the the worldly uh knowledge it's important it's absolutely important to do that so they can live in the dunya however the real knowledge the real blessing is the knowledge that they have about islam so that they can get to this point where they have this amazing understanding of allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and the religion and that is why even after he passed away he was called al bahar so this is a new word you're learning today al bahar al bahar means the sea the sea okay al bahar means the sea and he was called bahrul ilm so i'll write a few over here bah oh wait let me just let me do it properly oh bahrul ilm he was called the knowledge the sea of knowledge bahrul ilmi okay that is really bad handwriting guys <laughs> i can do better handwriting than this bahrul ilmi okay it's a bit hard to write on the screen but anyway 
Yes, subhanAllah. So you can just imagine he was, and I really like this picture because it makes so much sense. He was just a young boy and he had so much knowledge even when he was a young child. Now, my dear brothers and sisters, I, this is what I want to ask you. There are levels of understanding the Quran. Okay, so I really like this meme that I made. I actually made this meme specifically for this reason. So level one is you don't know anything about the Quran. Okay, fine. That's great. I mean, you know, we all start out like that, to be honest. We all start out like that. And then the second level is that you start to learn the tafsir in English. Okay, alhamdulillah, in tafsir. But we know now, we know now the reason why we need to learn Arabic, right? So when you start learning Arabic and then you study the tafsir, then subhanallah, imagine how much more in-depth knowledge and how much more wisdom you would be getting. And then after so many years of being at that level, so many years of um, excelling in your studies and so many years of studying in depth and diving deep into the oceans and the seas of knowledge to get the pearls, yes, because we're talking about the pearls of the tafsir, the pearls of knowledge, you know, then you get to this fourth level where you're so, you have so much knowledge that you, you give it to everybody else as well, you know, and everybody else benefits from it. So I want to ask you, which level do you think you are on at the moment? Level two? Awesome. Beautiful. Alhamdulillah, at least I think we all are at level two. You know, I wouldn't say that you know, don't know anything about the Quran because you've been with me for two, year, for two days. <laughs> you do know something about the Quran, alhamdulillah. But yes, my dear sisters and brothers from around the world, you know, we have to know that this is level one, two, three, and then four. And it is completely possible for us to get to level four as well in our lifetime if we truly, truly dedicate ourselves, you know. At least we can get to level three. Take the next step onto getting into level three, which is learning Arabic and then studying the tafsir as well. Yeah. So inshallah, may Allah Ta'ala give us tawfiq, may Allah Ta'ala give us the capability to get to this point. And you know what? To become a master of tafsir, to become a master of the exegesis and the explanation of the Quran, you, there are seven sciences, seven subjects that you need to master in order to be called a mufassir. A mufassir means an expert in tafsir. Okay? Subhanallah. So, science number one is we need to know about how the Quran was revealed. Okay? And the fact that there were stages to the revelation of the Quran. Was the Quran revealed all in one go, guys? No? Was the Quran revealed all in one go? No. Well, actually, it once was. And then there were two revelations of the Quran. So this is something that you might not have known before. Maybe you did know. But the Quran was revealed two times or it was sent down two times the tanzil means to send down something and it was sent down two times the first sending down was on laylatul qadr to the uh, lowest heaven to the sama dunya okay so the word of allah and then uh, the quran was sent down to the lowest heaven in laylatul qadr and that is what um, we learn from uh, Surah Al-Qadr, Inna anzalnahu fi Laylatul Qadr. Indeed, we have sent it down in the night of power. Okay, meaning we have sent down the Quran, Subhanallah, in Ramadan, right? So that was the first sending down, and then from that uh, stage, Jibrail alayhi salam, and through other forms of revelation, it came through to Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi salam over twenty-three years. So that was the second revelation over a period of 23 years, okay? And then after that, the companions memorized it and written it down, okay? And it was preserved on this dunya. So that is something interesting that you learned today, that the Quran was actually sent down two times. Once, all in one go, from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to the lowest heaven in Laylatul Qadr. And then the second revelation happened over a period of 23 years um, in different forms. Um, to the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and his companions wrote it down. Okay, so that is something that we need to know as well, and we need to know when these ayahs and these verses were revealed. The second thing that we need to know is the order and the arrangement of 
the verses and the surahs in the Quran. The Prophet ﷺ told him the order of the surahs and the ayahs, and these are actually from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And there's a whole science within itself of like, what is the relation between this surah and that surah? Why is this surah first and why is this surah second? You know, and that is a whole science in itself. The second, the third thing is how the Quran was written down, the Rasmul Quran. So, you know, the beautiful Quran that we have now was not always like, like this. In fact, one of the most earliest copies of the Quran was written like this. What do you think is different from this Quran to this Quran? Tell me some differences, guys. Let's see your explanation. What are some differences from, uh, from the normal Quran that we have today? The beautiful, you know, harakas, it has color-coded everything. And the original versions of the Quran that was written in the time of uh, Abu Bakr and Umar and Uthman. Yeah, so there's no harakas, as you can see. Okay, the, 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 it's handwritten, very good. There's no verse numbers. Um, there is no yeah this, even the way this, the handwriting is different the the script the material yes good good the compilation yep so you see subhanallah there's no harakas on it and it's written in ink as well and if you look very closely if you look very very closely guys there's actually no dots on the words as well there's actually no dots as well so subhanAllah, that's how they used to read the Qur'an back in the day of the Prophet ﷺ. There was no dots, there was no harakas, there was no stopping signs, and there was no surah numbers. And it was all just in one big book like this, a very thick book like this. So Zainab, you're asking how did they know the difference? It's because they were the people of the Qur'an. They, knew, they had memorized uh, everything word by word from the Prophet ﷺ. And also, we know that the, the Arabs, the Arabs of the, especially at, in the time of the Prophet them, they were literary geniuses. They knew their language so well that um, they, they knew how to read and write, uh, you know, just by, by this. However, when Islam started spreading and more non-Arabs came into Islam, then the, like a lot of confusion was happening you know people were learning arabic they didn't know how to read it and so that's why slowly by slowly people put the dots on the letters and then people put the harakas on the letters and then people put uh the as we can see over here so there's the the dots there's the harakas there's the um the name of the surahs and then now mashallah we even have the tajweed rules and we have it color coded and of course you know the quran that i'm going to give to five people at the end it also has the english translation and the translation on the side as well so that is the evolution of the quran and subhanallah you know how much effort has gone into creating this version of the quran so many hundreds of people have checked checked and double checked and made this beautiful version of the Quran, which is so easy for us to read now, subhanAllah. Before they used to handwrite every single Quran. Now we can print out hundreds of copies in one go. Yeah. So subhanAllah, is there any reason for us to not read the Quran? It's so widely available. And now we have the Quran in, um, in, on, on the internet, on our phones as well. Now there's even no, no reason. <laughs> there's like literally no reason why, why we should not be reading the Quran, you know? So Alhamdulillah Rabbil Alameen, the one who has made the Qur'an easy for us to remember. Uh, as, as I said in the first lecture, وَلَقَدْ يَسَّرُنَّ الْقُرْآنَ لِلذِّكْرِ فَهَلْ مِنْ مُدَّكِرِ Is that uh, we have certainly made the Qur'an easy for remembrance, so is there anyone who will remember? We also need to know the information about the reasons and occasions of revelation, which is called Asbab nuzul The Qur'an was sent down in stages for a reason, and we're going to talk about that later. Also, we need to know what was revealed in Mecca and what was revealed in Medina. So, Al Makki, the Makki surahs are revealed in Mecca, and the Madani surahs were revealed in Medina. And they both have different um, connotations and aspects. So, the Makki surahs, as you might, uh, when you study it, you'll un understand that 
The Makki surahs have strong words and short ayat. They talk about the Tawheed, the Prophethood, and the Akhirah. So they talk about the belief, you know, of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and the blessings of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And they talk about the powerful impact with strong, strong arguments. So it's talking about the arguments to say that Allah does exist, you know. The Madani surahs, they have a bit more of a gentle style and more longer ayat. The Madani surahs also have rulings of social dealings and transactions among people. So, for example, the ayah of hijab, it was actually revealed in Medina, not in Mecca, in Medina, after 10 years, more than 10 years, actually. For example, and, uh, you know, hajj, uh, zakat, all these things were revealed in the Medina time. And also, it includes detailed acts, uh, rulings of the acts of worship. So, subhanAllah, when we learn the tafsir, we actually go in depth with that. And now this is something else that you might not have known, but actually in the Quran, there are some verses which we still recite, but the ruling is not applicable in this day and age. Okay. Some rulings in some verses don't apply now, but they're still written in the Quran for some other wisdoms. Um, so for example, you know, there's actually an ayah in the Quran uh that uh, says that do not approach prayer while you are intoxicated so does that mean that you can approach prayer or you can pray if you're not intoxicated no of course not now we know that actually intoxication is haram of course but the quran as i said was sent down in stages okay and and uh actually uh wine and intoxicants were was made prohib prohibited in stages as well and this is something that we go in depth in our tafsir course. And number seven, the last thing that you need to know about um, the sciences of hadith, uh, the sciences of tafsir is about the clear and the unclear verses, which is called muhkamat and mutashabihat. So we need to know the differences between them. So for example, alif lam mim, is it a clear or an unclear verse? Who can tell me? It's an unclear verse, yes. Because Alif Lam Mim, it, it doesn't have, like, we don't know the meaning of it. It, probably, it has a meaning, absolutely. That's why it's in the Quran. But we don't know the meaning of it in this dunya. You know, only Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knows. And so we need to differentiate which one is clear and which one is unclear. So, yes, these are all the things that you need to know before you can even start doing tafsir. SubhanAllah, seven things. and Subhanallah, even if you study your whole life trying to prepare to do tafsir, you know, um, it's just amazing how much knowledge there is. Now, I want you to comment down below. What do you think is the reason why the Quran was sent down in over 23 years and not just in one go? So we know that the Quran was sent down over 23 years over different situations and incidents uh some ayahs you know one by one some surahs all together in different different parts the quran was sent down to the prophet why do you why do you think the quran wasn't sent down just in one book why didn't allah just give a book to the prophet or in one go yes good so the life experience uh of different events that happened to make us appreciate it more, absolutely. So we can learn and practice and apply. Well done. So that people can grasp. Would be easy for Sahabis to memorize. Yep, good. Uh, it was according to the need and implication. Yep, well done. To make it relevant to their lives. Excellent, excellent. Because certain things have happened. Yep, absolutely, everybody. Mashallah. So, actually, there are six reasons there are six reasons why the quran was sent down in stages and we're going to go through these six reasons right now okay uh -huh. so number one is to strengthen the heart of the prophet وسلم, by addressing him continuously and whenever the need for guidance arose so imagine just imagine everybody imagine the whole world is against you. You come with a new religion. The Prophet ﷺ is coming to the people of Mecca with a new religion saying that Allah is one. There is only one God. 
and all these other people they're worshiping hundreds of gods thousands of statues and all this kind of stuff and they just they just corrupted the religion completely right imagine the whole world is against you people are torturing your followers people are you know your your your, your children are passing away and the prophet sallallahu went through so many hardships in his life everybody and when you study the seerah of the prophet sallallahu you really you really understand how the prophet sallallahu actually had so much sabr and had so much hope and had so much resilience subhanallah and one of the reasons why the Quran was sent down in stages throughout the life of the Prophet ﷺ is so that the Prophet ﷺ can get that motivation and that inspiration from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala whenever he was feeling down, whenever he, was, he felt like, oh, I'm not cut out for this, whenever he felt like he couldn't do it. So, because imagine, <laughs> like, imagine if you're going to do a very big project, okay? You're maybe, for example, uh, you want to memorize the Quran, inshallah. May Allah Ta'ala give us tawfiq, everybody, to memorize the whole Quran, inshallah. So, for example, you're going to memorize the Quran, okay? And then my, me as your Quran teacher, I just come up to you and I'm like, yeah, you, you can do it. Uh, you're going to get so much reward, blah, blah, blah. And then that's it. I don't talk to you for like 10 years. Are you going to feel motivated? Are you going to feel like you can do it? Are you, are you even going to finish memorizing the Quran? No, of course not. Your Quran teacher or your coach or your uh, mentor, you know, or, you know, that you need to give your, you know, the person that you're taking care of, like, like motivation and inspiration and encouragement from time to time to time. Because as human beings, our motivation decreases and it increases. You know, we get like inspired and sometimes we feel depressed. Sometimes we're happy, sometimes we're sad. And we need other people around us to, to make us motivated and to make us feel like we can go on. And this is exactly what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala was doing to the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, for the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, you know, saying, فَصْبِرْ كَمَا صَبَرَ أُولُ الْعَزْمِ مِنَ الرُّسُلِ So be patient as the messengers of might were patient. And that's why Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gives so many examples, so many stories of the previous Prophets. Why? So the Prophet ﷺ and his followers can know that, hey, you know what? We're not the only ones who went through hardships in propagating and upholding Islam. We're not the only ones. Our brothers from past generations, our the prophets of Nuh ﷺ, of uh, Shu'aib, of um, of uh, Salih, of uh, Ibrahim, Ismail, all these prophets, they also went through hardships as well. And we also we feel that we feel the hardships of the prophets who have come before and of the prophet and so we also need that motivation um over the period of our life as well and that is why we can't just read the quran once and that's it khalas, we're done no the quran is meant to be recited again and again because every single time that you read the quran so many different like interpretations and so many different wisdoms come to you it jumps out at your face when you're and you know your mind opens in so many different ways when you're in different stages of your life I, imagine if you read the quran when you were a kid and then you read the quran when you're a teenager and then when you read the quran when you're an adult and then when you read the quran when you before you have kids you got married and now you have, and before you have kids and then after you have kids and then when your kids have kids you know you're going to be thinking about life differently. You're going to be thinking about, uh, you know, your priorities differently and different things will stand out to you from the Quran at different stages of your life. Isn't that right, everybody? <clears throat> so that is why we must read the Quran again and again, again and again. We cannot, we can't just stop studying the Quran. <clears throat> and in fact, you know what? The, the Kuffar, they also asked the Prophet Sallallahu Oh, why didn't the Quran, uh, why wasn't it sent down at one time? And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, كَذَلِكَ لِنُثَبِّتَ بِهِ فُؤَادَكَ Thus that we may strengthen your heart by it and we have arranged it well in arranging. Okay? Okay, beautiful. So um, because we started a little bit late, we're going to go a little bit over time. So please be patient. I have a lot of amazing things to share with you today. So inshallah, hopefully uh, you'll learn a lot. So the second, um, the second reason why the Quran was sent down in stages was 
to have consideration for the Prophet since revelation was actually a very intense um, experience for him. Okay, it was a very intense experience for him. Imagine, imagine that you are climbing up a mountain. It's a very intense experience, right? Now imagine that it's not even imaginable, but imagine if you, the, the, the mountain, you have to carry the mountain. Imagine if you were carrying a huge boulder. Imagine if you were carrying a huge uh, stone. And imagine if you were carrying a whole mountain. That is sort of kind of like how the Prophet Sallallahu the intensity, the, the difficulty, the heaviness of the revelation, that is how much heavy it was for the Prophet Sallallahu And in actual fact, this is, it's, it's actually mentioned in the Quran that even the mountains would be humbled and coming apart from the fear of Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala if the Quran was sent down upon a mountain. But then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala chose the Prophet sallallahu his beautiful heart to carry the Qur'an and to convey to us. Now, this is a beautiful hadith. Uh, it's from sunnah.com, which is an authentic website for hadiths, if you want to know. Um, that uh, This is the narration of Aisha radiallahu anha, that when the Prophet sallallahu was being given the wahi, was being given the revelation, uh, even on a very cold day, I would notice the sweat dripping from his forehead uh, until the revelation was over. So when the he was receiving the revelation from Jibrail, it was a very intense experience for him. So imagine this was like over 23 years he used to experience this uh, feeling, you know. Imagine if the whole Quran came down at one time on him. Would he be able to handle it? SubhanAllah, we don't know. So this is actually a mercy of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala just to... Um, for the Prophet ﷺ to make the revelation easier for him. Okay, number three is to gradually implement the laws of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So we know that, imagine if you became a Muslim straight away and then they, you get like a whole bunch of books and they're like, you know what, just read it, follow it and bye. as alaikum. You would be so discouraged, right? You know, becoming closer to Allah, practicing the deen, it comes in stages. And just like that, even for the early Muslims, for the first community also, it was in stages. So for 10 years, from the time that the Prophet ﷺ became a prophet until he migrated to Medina, the, most, the main things that were talked about was Iman. To believe in Allah, to believe in Allah, to believe in Allah, to love Allah, subhanahu wa ta'ala. And, and why? Why, why did Allah talk about loving Allah and believing in Allah for 10 years before he even told them to pray? Because when you love Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and you know exactly who Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is, then you will do anything for Allah. You will do anything for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Yeah? And that is why the five times daily salah was actually revealed in the 10th year of the prophethood, 10 years after the Prophet ﷺ became a prophet, you know, and that's, and when the Muslims, they received this, uh, this five times daily salah, they were so happy, you know, they're like, this is a gift from Allah, this is a treasure from Allah, you know, it wasn't a burden for them, it was a treasure, because now they knew that, hey, they had direct access to Allah five times a day, direct access, can you believe it? And then the fasting was made, um, the fasting of Ramadan for 30 days, it was made after Hijra, okay? Um, they used to fast before, but it was only 10 days. And the 30 days or the whole month fasting became fard after Hijra, after they became, uh, they settled in Medina. Zakat became obligatory in the second year after Hijra and Hajj became obligatory in the sixth year after Hijra. So you see, it, wasn't, it didn't come down all in one go. And the fun fact is, did you know that wine and alcohol was not prohibited from Islam, from the start of Islam? It was actually prohibited in four stages. Okay, and maybe inshallah, I will do another lesson just on this because it's very interesting to know that, oh, like Islam didn't prohibit wine straight away. Okay, um, inshallah, I'm going to do another lesson on this. We don't have time right now. Uh, but Inshallah, uh, keep 
stay in tune or keep a lookout on this Facebook group and on YouTube and on Instagram, uh, on my Instagrams, inshallah, I'll do a whole lesson on this because it's really, really interesting. Number four is to make understanding and application and memorization of the revelation easier for the believers. So we need to understand that the Sahaba, they were mostly illiterate. They didn't know how to read or write. So if you gave them a book, they wouldn't know what to do with it. They don't know how to read, most of them. And even the Prophet Sallallahu he was illiterate. He wasn't uneducated. He was illiterate, meaning he just didn't know how to read or write. But they had amazing memories. They had amazing memories. So that's why they, they memorized the Quran in that way. And of course, as you saw before, they didn't have proper paper. They didn't have many scribes to write down the Quran. And they had lives too. You know, they had wives, wives, they had children, they had jobs. They couldn't just uh, sit down and memorize the Quran 24 seven, right? So that is why, you know, the Quran was sent down in stages so that um, people could still live in this dunya and also learn the deen of Islam as well. Okay. And also they were at the place of the incident. So um, let me just tell you <clears throat> the fifth reason is actually that, uh, as you guys said, it was true. Uh, the fifth reason why the Quran was sent down in stages was to reveal verses according to the situation and the incidents that occurred and as answers to people's questions. So everybody knows this surah, yeah? What surah is this? This is? This is Surah Ikhlas, yeah? Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Qul huwa Allahu ahad, Allahu samad, lam yalid, wa lam yulad, wa lam yakun lahu kufuwan ahad. Okay? So this Surah is talking about the oneness of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The fact that he's not uh, born, he doesn't have children, and there is nothing like unto him. So, the reason of revelation is... One day, the pagans, the mushrikeen, the disbelievers, they came to the Prophet ﷺ and said, Oh, Muhammad, these are our gods. These are our statues, as you can see. You know, we have these statues made of wood. We have our statues we made of gold. We have these other statues made of other things. Okay, so we can see them. How about you? What is your, describe your God to us. Is your God made of silver or gold or iron? SubhanAllah, this is the question that they ask. And if you respond to our questions, maybe we believe in you and we become Muslims. And then the Prophet he didn't say anything. But then after three days, Surah Ikhlas was revealed, and it was the perfect, um, it was a perfect answer to these mushrikeen, to these disbelievers. Yeah, that Allah is one. He is the eternal refuge. He was not made. He was not born. He did not give birth, or he was he did not have a son. And there is not, nothing like unto him. And I actually go in depth in tafsir uh, of this in the 12-week Quranic Arabic course that I'm running. We don't have time now. Otherwise, I would love to tell you that the, like more of the tafsir of this because it's just amazing. And another thing that I'd like you to do your own research on, okay, is the hadith of ifk, the slander. Because... What happened is that Aisha radiallahu anha, she was slandered. What does slander mean? It means that she was accused of doing something really bad. Subhanallah, the wife of the Prophet وسلم, was accused of doing something really bad, like really, really bad. And the munafiqeen, the hypocrites, they were the ones who were bringing this uh, accusation and this conspiracy and all this kind of stuff, this propaganda. Um, and drama into the Muslims and subhanallah this surah from surah al-nur okay um, some verses from surah al-nur were uh, revealed to exonerate Aisha radiallahu anha and to uh, tell people of her innocence you know so I actually encourage you search this up the hadith of ifk, the slander of the prophet, uh, of the wife of the prophet, Aisha radiallahu anha. And hopefully, inshallah, maybe I can do a lesson on this as well. Because whenever I think about the situation Aisha radiallahu anha was in, I just get shivers. I'm like, oh my God, subhanAllah, how did she go through that? And it's just amazing how Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the one who said that she's innocent and she didn't do that thing. Yeah. 
And the next point, number six, is to point to the miraculous nature of the Qur'an. Now imagine, the Qur'an is coming down in bits and pieces over 23 years. But when you read the Qur'an, it's as if it's like one, one, um, one flowing verse, one flowing surah, you know? Uh, so Tahira, you can find this uh, hadith on sunnah.com and you just write the, you write the hadith of ifk, I-F-K. Okay, and then you'll find it. So yes, what was I saying? To point to the miraculous nature of the Quran. Each verse is a jigsaw piece out of a beautiful holistic picture sent down over 23 years, but it still makes sense. You know, if for example, you're writing a story or you're writing an essay, okay? I think a lot of us has been, a lot of us people, uh, a lot of you people, and me included, we've been to uni, for example. And in uni, we make, uh, we do essays and we do thesis and all this kind of stuff. If you wrote a thesis over 23 years, do you think your writing style is going to stay the same? Do you think your, um, your thoughts and your ideas are going to stay the same? It's going to be very different, right? But when you read the Quran, the, the same, like, the miraculous nature of the Quran is still the same. You know, the beauty of the Quran is still the same. Uh, some surahs have different tones, like some are very short ayahs, some are very long ayahs, and that's beautiful in itself. But subhanAllah, it still makes sense and it's still like it flows so beautifully, right? Now, my dear brothers and sisters, this is what I want to say to you. Even if it takes you 23 years or more, you know, continue learning the Quran, never stop learning. If the Prophet Sallallahu and the companions, it took them 23 years, you know, we can't be discouraged after 23 hours or 23 days or 23 uh, weeks, you know, so or months, you know, the study of the Quran goes forever and ever and ever. Yeah. Subhanallah. It can never stop. And let me tell you why it can never stop. Okay. Now I'm going to tell you my most recommended books of tafsir from 10 years of experience. So alhamdulillah, um, as you guys know, I've studied Islam and Arabic for the past 10 years, alhamdulillah. And, um, you know, I've been teaching for a long time as well. So that, you know, alhamdulillah, you, alhamdulillah, I do have a bit of experience in in tafsir and what types of tafsir there is so hopefully i can recommend some tafsir books that can get you started on learning the tafsir straight away now before we do that i want you to guess what this is okay so this is a picture from my house this is in one of my rooms so it's like a shelf type of thing okay can you guys just see that so and it's covered with a sheet so I want you to tell me what do you think is underneath this this bed sheet, this sheet basically. Okay. <laughs> yes, good. No, it's not a bed. It's not a bed. Tafsir books, hadith books, 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 books. Yes. Food. Who said food? It's not food. <laughs> no, it's not food, my dear sister. It is books like so many books mashallah this is my this is our collection of books um of tafsir oh we have tafsir tabrani okay cool i didn't know we had that so my brother mashallah he's a uh, so his name is tahseen alam um mashallah my brother he's a mufti and he's an alim and he's a hafiz as well and he loves collecting books and especially tafsir books okay so alhamdulillah we have a lot of books from around the world from different scholars and now you know and one and of course my mom she wants to keep the house tidy and stuff so that's why she puts like bed sheets on top of it so the dust doesn't go on the books everything in my house is covered with bed sheets by the way does anyone relate with that <laughs> anyway it's it's just a thing that we have in our house now i want you to guess okay just knowing a little bit of introduction from myself and my brother okay who can guess how many bookshelves not even books how many bookshelves we have in our house so this is one of them we have one number one how many bookshelves do we have in our house who can guess five six seven ten eight 
your shelf is the garden of knowledge. Yes, that's right. And I'm going to tell you why me and my brother, we collect so many books. Um, 16, 18, <laughs> subhanAllah. <laughs> Bookshelves in each room. Okay, good. Seven, 17 is the goal. It's less than 17. I'll just give you that guess. I'll give you that, um, you know. Okay, okay. So, so let's let's guess, okay, guys. So we have one, one bookshelf in our living room. We have two on one side. So one, two, three, one, two, three. Okay. And then we have on the other side we have another two bookshelves. Uh, four, five. Yep. And if you if you look in this box, there's even more books, and we need to buy another shelf for these books. <laughs> Subhanallah, it's too many books, man. Alhamdulillah. And then, um, okay, so where, where, where are we up to? Okay, wait, one, two, three, four, five, yeah. Uh, six, we have Tafsir Ibn Kathir on that one. Six, seven, eight. This is like, it has like my mom's books on it. Uh, nine, this is my brother's room. He keeps it much more neater than <laughs> the other rooms nine and then 10. We have 10 bookshelves in our house. Say mashallah, tabarakallah, everybody. Say mashallah, tabarakallah, okay? Alhamdulillah, it's from the mercy of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And mostly my brother is the one who uh, collected these books. You know, like if you give him a book, he doesn't want, he doesn't care about like getting like fancy cars or nothing. He, if you give him like a rare book, like a volume of books, then he'll be so happy. And subhanAllah, and mashallah, he's an alim, so you know, we, he needs those books as well. And subhanAllah, when I, whenever I go into <laughs> um, our living room, I just look at the books and I'm just like, so many books, so little time. Even if I was to live for 200 years, it's not, it's like subhanAllah, who's gonna finish reading all these books here? Who's gonna finish? reading these books it is like a sea of knowledge it's a sea of knowledge and by the way all these books are in arabic we don't really collect that many english books we only collect arabic books because why the english books are translated from the arabic books so like we know arabic so we're going to get the original version you know but you know what my goal inshallah is to translate some of these books for you um, to do lectures like this, to do classes like this on some of these books, at least a few volumes, inshallah. This is my life goal, inshallah. So please, you know, I hope that you stay with me throughout this journey. This is a journey for me as well. And I hope that inshallah, you can stay with me with this journey uh, of me telling you and conveying to you. I'm just a conveyor. I didn't come up with the knowledge in this book, in these books, but because I know Arabic, at least I can tell you what the original scholar is saying, you know, um, and explain it in my ukhti way, you know, in my, in my style, inshallah. Every, because every scholar has their own style and uh, I hope that you like my style, you know, not just in my outfits, but also in my teaching style, you know. Okay, bismillah. So let's go ahead. One of my favorite tafsirs is uh, Mafatih al ghaib or it's called At-Tafsir al-Kabir. Um, and it's written by Imam Fakhruddin al-Razi. So Tafsir al-Kabir literally means the big Tafsir, <laughs> the large exegesis. And I really love this Tafsir because it, it like the, he, oh, I can't even explain it guys. It, like the mind of Imam Fakhruddin al-Razi is just amazing. As you, you might not know this, but he was actually a doctor as well. So he has a very analytical mind and he explains the verses in so many different ways. And you know that story that I told you about the, the moon, the, the, the late, the, the king and the moon and stuff. I got that story from Tafsir al-Kabir, okay? So he tells a lot of amazing stories as well that are very relevant to each ayah as well. Um, yes. And in fact, this Tafsir is 32 volumes. And it's in 11 books, you know, and Alhamdulillah, we have like a proper version of it now. Imagine he hand wrote 32 volumes of books. Yes, these are all written in Arabic. 
And um, even he didn't even finish writing this Tafsir al Kabir. He wrote up to Surah Fath, and then another scholar named Qadi uh, Shahabuddin uh, bin Khalil, he completed it. SubhanAllah. May Allah Ta'ala bless them both. The second uh, Tafsir book that I recommend, and this is actually one of my first Tafsirs that I ever had, is um, Anwarul Bayan. This is an English translation. It was trans, uh, translated, but the original version is uh, by Maulana Ashiq Ilahi al Barni. And he was one of the greatest scholars, and he passed away in Medina recently, a few years ago. Okay, so this is a really good tafsir as well. Another tafsir that I absolutely love and I recommend everybody to get is Ma'arif al Quran. Has anyone heard of Ma'arif al Quran? So, Ma'arif al Quran is an eight volume tafsir and it's written by a Pakistani scholar. His name is Mufti Muhammad Shafi. Okay, mashallah, it is just amazing, and alhamdulillah, I'm so glad that it was translated into English. So it's originally written in Urdu and it was translated into English uh, because SubhanAllah, his uh, explanation is just amazing. And you can find all of these books on Amazon, by the way. Um, the other, oh, all of them are my favorite, guys. Like In the Shade of the Quran, this is actually one of my favorite ones. It's one of the modern day tafsirs. Um, and when I say modern day, I don't mean like, oh, it's like modern science things or whatever it's written by like a modern day scholar Sayyid Qutb he was an Egyptian scholar uh, during the 1950s and 60s and subhanallah he used, he was actually pr imprisoned by the government for some reasons okay and he and he wrote this tafsir while he was in prison okay and subhanallah his it's just the most intellectual discussion that you can ever have when you read his tafsir, it's just amazing. And Alhamdulillah, it is um, translated into English. At least volume 30 is translated into English. Otherwise, the whole thing is in Arabic. And I'm telling you, it's just amazing. Inshallah, I want to study this tafsir in depth because it's just fantastic. Now, the tafsir that I recommend to everybody, the most simplest one and the most authentic one is tafsir ibn Kathir. Has anyone heard of tafsir ibn Kathir? Yes. So actually, when I was studying uh, in my six year Alimiya course, we studied uh, Mukhtasar, the, uh, the summarized version of Tafsir ibn Kathir in depth. Uh, we practically memorized the whole Tafsir ibn Kathir. Alhamdulillah, it was one of my favorite subjects. And um, Alhamdulillah, uh, I, I also taught it to my students as well. And I teach it in my 12 week Arabic course as well. Um, and I really like this tafsir. Why? Because it's easy to understand and it has the authentic hadiths as well. And you know, uh, Ibn Kathir, he wrote uh, a history book. It's called Al Bidayah wa Nihaya and it's 20 volumes. And it's the history of the beginning and end of time. <laughs> and it is huge. It takes up the whole shelf. So, subhanAllah, subhanAllah, how much, how much knowledge is there? Is there, there's so many, this, can't even explain that you know subhanallah you have learned so much today and what we are learning here today is just a drop in the ocean the oceans of knowledge subhanallah the oceans of knowledge and alhamdulillah we start with one drop and then another one and then another one and then eventually you become the ocean of knowledge as well just like ibn abbas radiallahu anhu he became the bahar the bahar means the sea of knowledge but the Arabic language, my dear brothers and sisters, is the key to the traditional Islamic sciences. Okay, If you know Arabic, then you can unlock all these books. You can unlock the whole shelf. You can unlock the whole garden of Quranic Arabic, as we said before. You can now learn tafsir. You can learn hadith. For example, Bukhari. Alhamdulillah, we had a Bukhari maqra'ah. A recitation just uh, today we're going to do the khatam today and we're going to have a dua so it's actually recommended to recite bukhari uh during calamities and you know we know the situation of the world right now so we so uh, my brother and his uh sheikhs from overseas they decided to do a bukhari recitation so uh, inshallah we're going to finish that today and uh, sahih muslim uh, you're going to learn about the usul the foundation subjects even you can learn classical Arabic poetry. Guys, I love Arabic poetry. Who would love to study Arabic poetry with me? 
you know, like Qasida Burda. Has anyone heard of Qasida Burda? Has anyone heard of Qasida Burda? Yes, Qasida Burda is very beautiful. Um, it's a very beautiful poem written about the praise and the and the and written uh, about the love of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, and it's just beautiful. And if you know the Arabic proper Arabic, the classical Arabic, then you can read books by Imam Ghazali, Imam Tay Ibn Taymiyyah, Ibn, uh, Ibn Qayyim, all these scholars, you have access to their knowledge. And these are scholars who were, who, who had passed away hundreds of years ago in this 21st century, you still have access to them. You still can learn from them, subhanAllah. And that is why I teach Quranic Arabic in my 12 week certified Quranic Arabic course. And that's why I call this keys to the Quran because Arabic is the key to the Quran, subhanAllah. And it's not just the key to the Quran, it's the key to all these other knowledge that you can have, yeah? So inshallah, I'm gonna tell you about my 12 week Quranic Arabic course on Friday, okay? So please, inshallah, stay until the end. And I'm gonna have a huge, huge discount ready for you guys. And also, we're going to do the giveaway on Friday as well. So, yes, you can learn 70% of the Quran in just 12 weeks. Now, we're going to end with this hadith. Okay, this hadith is very beautiful. And I want to share this with you. Okay, we talked about these scholars. We talked about these, uh, the authors of these big tafsir books. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. This hadith says, Inna al-anbiya lam dinaran wala dirham. Verily, the scholars are the inheritors of the prophets. The scholars are the inheritors of the prophets. They do not leave behind gold or silver coins, but rather they leave behind knowledge. Whoever has taken hold of it has been given an abundant share. So, what is more important? What, when we think of inheritance, we think of money, we think of property, we think of land. But the, the prophets did not leave behind that kind of inheritance. He left behind, they left behind knowledge. And it isn't, it, isn't it such a beautiful thing that anyone can take from the inheritance of the prophet? Yeah, anyone can take the knowledge. And whoever takes the most knowledge has the best you know, it has taken the best thing, you know. May Allah Ta'ala give us the knowledge that will benefit us and benefit what? Us with the knowledge. Allahumma anfa'ana bima allamtana wa allimna ma yanfa'una wa zidna alma. And we all know that the three pillars is to learn Quranic vocabulary, tafsir, translation, and Arabic grammar. And we all know, like I said yesterday, that to have the real key to the Quran is to have all three of these things. And so Alhamdulillah, on day two, we learned about gems from the Quranic Arabic vocabulary. On day three today, Alhamdulillah, we have gone through the pearls from the tafsir, the pearls. How do you say pearls in Arabic? Who knows? Pearls. Yes, look, look. Very good, look, look. Very good. And on day four, inshallah, we're going to learn the gold from the Arabic grammar. Because we know we have the gems, we have the pearls, and now we're going to have the gold from the Arabic grammar. And you know why we need to learn this? Because have you ever wondered what is the difference between a fatha, kasra, and dhamma? Have you ever seen these before in the Quran? Of course you have. <laughs> in every single letter, there is a fatha, dhamma, or kasra. And so when you learn Arabic grammar, it will all make sense why a word has a fatha, why it has a kasra, and why it has a dhamma. And this is like the most important thing that you need to learn. And subhanAllah, when you learn Arabic grammar, you will understand how easy and how logical the Arabic language is. Okay? So I really, it's going to be amazing. I love Arabic grammar and I love teaching it as well. And I teach it in a very fun and interesting way. And remember, Arabic grammar is a cement for the bricks of vocabulary. So inshallah, when I give you the 10 words a day challenge at the end of the course, then inshallah, uh, when you have Arabic grammar, you can put them all together. So tomorrow, inshallah, we're going to learn. Oh. 
Okay. Sorry, something happened here. <laughs> okay, my slides just went away somehow. Yeah, so tomorrow, inshallah, we're going to learn about the Arabic grammar. We're going to learn about um, why it is actually very dangerous to, uh, yeah, here it is. Sorry, guys. Technical issues. We're going to end the class in two minutes, okay? Yes. And I'm going to give you some homework as well. So tomorrow, inshallah, what we're going to learn is we're going to learn about the miraculous nature of the Quran, okay, how eloquent the Quran is. We're gonna, and we're going to learn about how you can learn Arabic grammar in an easy and fun way. Okay, awesome. Let's go to our homework. So the homework today is just very simple. Just write three new things you have learned today. Okay. And number two is which surah would you like to study the tafsir of in depth and why? That's it. So what's the homework? Okay. Write three new things you learned today. And number two, which surah would you really like to study the tafsir of? And if there's a lot of requests for like one particular surah, then inshallah, I'll do another a free course on that as well. You know, so like subhanallah, I really, and you have to tell me why you want to study that surah as well. Okay, so it doesn't have to be that long. Just tell me three new things and which surah you would like to study. And of course, you can comment on the Facebook um, in the homework post. You can email me at Good Tree Arabic Academy or you can DM me on Instagram at Good Tree Arabic Academy. Okay. Remember, you need to do the homework if you want to still be in the giveaway for the five Qur'ans that I'm going to give away on Friday, inshallah. So please keep that in mind and follow us on social media channels, uh, Good Tree Arabic Academy on, in on Instagram, Facebook and YouTube. Please like and share the official Facebook page, Good Tree Arabic Academy. So thank you to those people who liked and shared yesterday. I seriously appreciate it. And remember, when you share this, someone learns from this, you're going to get the reward for it, okay? So inshallah, jazakumullah khair, everyone. I shall see you tomorrow. And do you guys want to learn something, uh, something really interesting? Uh, I see a lot of people, they don't know how to write inshallah. So I'm going to teach you today how to write inshallah. Who wants to write inshallah in Arabic? Anyone want to know how to write inshallah in Arabic? And I'll teach you how to do it with um, Arabic, with the beautiful Arabic handwriting as much as I can. So, uh, you know, just DM me or take, take a picture of you writing inshallah and send it to me as well or post it on the comment box below. So the first thing that you need to do is you write alif. So this alif is just a line, okay? And then you do the hamza underneath. And then you do the noon like this. And then you do a dot. And then you do a sukun on top. Actually, you know what? Well, let me do it with, let me do it with this, okay? So in, okay, in, and then sha, sha, a, and then it's Allahu. This is how you write Allah. Okay, inshallah. So this is how you write inshallah. Okay, it's three separate words. In means if, sha a means wills. And Allah means Allah. So inshallah means if Allah wills. Okay. Was that interesting? So no, you have to make sure that this uh, Hamza is underneath, is on the other. It's not on top of the alif like that. No, that's not correct. It has to be next to it. Okay. So yes. So okay, inshallah, everybody, I shall see you tomorrow hopefully we don't have any disruptions and then um inshallah I, i'm looking forward to reading your homework and um tomorrow we're going to be doing gold from the arabic grammar and it's going to blow your mind inshallah okay everybody assalamu alaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh okay